All right, ladies and germs. Um, <clears throat> here is section two of the historic lessons. This one's a little longer, um, so uh, just bear with me and we'll go through it. And again, as always, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me at rdion at gltech.org. Uh, again, that's rdion at gltech.org. All right, so we're going to describe some historical impact of communications in establishing advanced civilizations. I'm going to tie a little bit there this morning. So uh, here we go. So the printing process has been around um, you know, for a long time. Uh, as you can see, as we had talked about already, um, you can, uh, in my PowerPoints, there are some interactive links here that you are able to click on and go to get some additional information, OK? So <clears throat> we will continue here. All right, so 3000 BC <clears throat> and earlier, Meth Mesopotamians, Mesopotamians, they used a round cylinder seal uh, for rolling impressions of images onto clay tablets, all right? Uh, in other early societies in China, um, Egypt, they used small stamps uh, and used that to print on cloth. And you'll see some of this stuff um, as we go through here, some examples. Uh, second century, you know, um, paper was invented uh, in China. Um, so, and this gentleman, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this person's name right, but I think it's Sai Lun, uh, is accredited with doing that. Uh, <clears throat> then we've got some, you know, a small book in the 17, uh, excuse me, seventh century, um, basically containing text of the Gospel of John in Latin is added to the grave site of Saint Cuthbert. Uh, and in 1104, they find this in his coffin. For some reason, they decide to open it. Uh, it was in the Durham Cathedral in Britain, and they find this book. That's a sample. Well, actually, that's the book that they found, uh, which is kind of pretty cool when you stop and think about it because, um, <clears throat> you know, we as a society have a really good tendency to throw stuff away. So, 11th century. Um, Fai Xing develops type characters from hardened clay, which is basically the invention of the first movable type. It's soft, so it doesn't last very long, but it, it, it does actually work. Paper making in the 12th century reaches Europe. And when you stop and think about that, that's 12th century. Well, it was invented like three or 400 years prior to this. Why, why did it take so long? When you think about this, uh, how, how does something get from China to Europe? It's a big continent there that they've got to cross and get all that all the way over. So, you know, when you think about the mode of transportation, it was either by foot or horseback or something. That wasn't like they had uh, airplanes and stuff like that to get around. That's why it probably took so long to get all the way over there to uh, Europe. 13th century, you know, type cast, characters cast of metal, which started out as bronze. They developed in China, Japan, and Korea. Oldest known book using metal type. Um, <clears throat> to, uh, dated back to the year 1377, and it's a Buddhist uh, document. I think I have a picture of it coming up here, so it's an example of it. And this was used metal type. They now had moved away from clay, uh, and they're using metal type, so obviously this stuff will last a lot longer. Uh, this is an example of movable type. Each letter is placed in reverse. Uh, this way, when it's printed directly on paper, it will be right reading. So again, when you hand set type, this is old letterpress stuff. Uh, and again, they would have done this even before uh, we switched to the most common metal type, which was used up until the, like the 1970s. And ironically, it's making kind of a rebound now where you're finding letterpress shops that are opening up again. Um, you cast this uh, in reverse. So the top line is the first line, obviously, and it works its way down. And you set all this type in reverse. And people that do this or did this for a living, uh, had to have the ability to be able to read backwards and had to not a spell. And all I did on the picture on the bottom is I did flip the image around so that you can see what it actually says uh, <clears throat> in the, uh, um, the, the little uh, hand chase that they have there. So uh, this is a very popular saying, and you'll see this again throughout this lesson. 15th century woodcut, it's been around for centuries. Uh, in China and Japan, it's the oldest known European specimen, uh, goes back to the 15th century. And again, woodcut is like the metal, but obviously the uh, 
fonts and all that stuff, images were done in wood. Now the downside to wood is that <clears throat> when it gets wet, it swells and then it could splinter and eventually it may not be as good uh, for an impression standpoint down the road. Uh, and when you look at how they made ink way back then, uh, it was basically the soot from lamp oil. So they used some sort of, um, could have been uh, whale oil or something like that in these lanterns. Uh, and when they burned off, it would create soot. So they would take that soot, you know, and they would boil it with linseed oil. And that's how they made the first types of ink. So again, it was probably pretty liquefied at that point. Uh, and when it hit the wood, obviously the wood would start to chafe or swell and then you'd have other issues down the road. Now, books are still rare because um, <clears throat> people are, or people, I shouldn't say people, but scribes, typically monks and stuff like that, uh, would do hand, all books, any book that was copied was written by hand. So if somebody did the Bible, they'd have to start with page one and then go all the way through the whole book before they could do one, uh, one copy. And um, so it was very laborious. Uh, University of Cambridge has the largest uh, library in Europe, consisting of just about 122 books of, of, of scribe type books, means handwritten. In 1436, Gutenberg, I mentioned him earlier, begins work on a printing press. Takes him four years, so by 1440, he finally finishes his press and it uses metal type, which is something else that he develops as well. Among his first publications to get printed on this new device are Bibles. The first edition has 40 lines per page, and then later he revised it and goes 42 lines per page, which makes um, the volumes go, um, he, by gaining two lines per page, um, he's eventually able to make the, the volumes, uh, gets it down to two volumes, all right? So here's a picture of uh, the Gutenberg Press, um, what uh, he developed. Ironically, I, I don't really talk too much about, but um, Johannes Gutenberg, um, had to finance a lot of this, and uh, he ended up dying a poor guy. Uh, in 1465, uh, first dry plane engravings are created by House Book Ma Master, a South German artist. And basically, what they do is they take a piece of copper and they just use this point of needle to create these uh, images, drawings, or whatever. And and it's uh, printed in a Venice uh, in their print shop in Venice, John and Weldon and Spire are probably the first printers to use Roman type. You know, uh, and Roman type is still around. Uh, it's actually used quite um, quite extensively, actually, so times Roman, stuff like that. Uh, now, in 1476, William Caxton buys equipment from the Netherlands and establishes the first printing press in England at Westminster. Um, and, Kat, and this next slide I'm going to show you is his print shop, showing the king. Uh, about what he's got. Again, he's got a Gutenberg press, and when you think about it, that block, he's got the paper off to the left, the block section in the middle is where the images are. The paper would be on that, it would slide to the right <clears throat> where the press is, and then that handle gets pulled, makes the impression, and that's how the, um, that's how, that's really revolutionizes the way printing is done, because you no longer do you have to hand write everything. Uh, that same year, copper engravings uh, for the first time used in, for illustrations, engravings, or drawings, stuff like that. By the end of the century, um, printing has become established in more than 250 cities around Europe. And one of the things that kind of leads from all this, we'll call it mass production of the age, is now there's a lot of books around. And they established the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is where all these printing companies can bring their books for sale. Okay, and you'll learn more about books and reading uh, here in a bit. Okay, 16th century, all this Monatis uh, is the first printer to come up with the smaller, more portable books. <clears throat> He's also the first guy to use italic type. Okay, uh, and again, just kind of keep that in mind because it's uh, it helps make, um, because he was able to use italic type and make things a little smaller, so... More and more information up per page makes things much smaller, meaning in a sense of less pages per book. 1507, uh, Lucas Crunchuk invents um, this. Uh, again, I might not pronounce this right. Kiriaskuro woodcut, and again, it's re reproducing two or more printed blocks, so two different colors. Okay, so it's the kind of the first stages of hey, 
and we have, and not only are we going to print black, but we're going to print black plus another color. All right, you can see this in this example. Uh, and when you stop about and think about this, this, somebody had to do this on a block of wood, and anything that's printed obviously is raised. Anything that's not printed is carved out. So somebody had to take the time to, you know, figure out this whole layout of how the midtones and highlights would uh, would work in this particular image. And yes, I'm aware of that big, weird looking bird in the background with no feathers. Uh, my students always seem to get a kick out of that. Not sure why, but they always ask about the bird. Don't know. 1525, famous painter, woodcarver and copper engraver, Albrecht Dürer. He publishes um, um, this book, and it's a course on the art of measurement. And again, it's really become, it's the first book on typography and geometry letters and stuff like that. And then uh, there's another book out, um, the uh, Petro Bembo. Uh, and again, a Venetian scholar and a cardinal who uh, most famous works are the Italian language and poetry. Uh, Bembo actually is a typeface that uh, is still around. It's named after him, but here's the, here's the book. Uh, Plankton uh, is one of the most famous printers of the century. In his print shop uh, in Antwerp, he produces fine works, ornamate, ornamated, ornamented, mented, sorry, ornamented uh, with engravings such as Rubens and artists. Many of his works are well known. Um, <clears throat> I have a friend of mine that actually has been to this museum, and that's a sample of it. It's a pretty cool place when you stop and think about it, uh, that they preserved it. Uh, and I got a friend of mine, in fact, his name is Frank Mano, who runs the printing museum in Haverhill, Massachusetts. He has actually been to this museum. Uh, 17th century, um, Planton is also the first to print a facsimile. And basically, it's like your fax machine of today without the electronic part. It's a reproduction of a book, manuscript, map, art print, whatever. So he's the first guy to kind of do it. Uh, <clears throat> and... So that's uh, how that kind of comes about. The word not is accidentally left out of Exodus 20.14 in a 1631 reprint of the King James Bible. Archbishop of Canterbury and the King Charles are not amused when they learn that the God commanded Moses, thou shalt commit adultery. It technically is supposed to say, thou shalt not commit adultery. The printers, Robert Barker and Marcus, uh, Martin Lucas, uh, they're fined. And back then, you needed a license to print, and their license was revoked. And this version of the Bible is referred to as the Wicked Bible um, and it, or the Sinner's Bible. Adulterous Bible is also some of the names. And here's a sample of the page. You know, honor thy father and mother. Um, <clears throat> thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not Thou shall not commit adultery is what it should say, but it says thou shall commit adultery. Probably just a cruel little joke that somebody played that was not taken very seriously by the king and the cardinal. Uh, the Louvre is established in 1640. Again, if you uh, know anything about art, that is the uh, premier um, <clears throat> uh, museum in France. And it's been around again uh, since 1640. And it's got a whole ton of stuff in there. 1642, um, Ludwig von Siegen, he invents the mezzotint. It's a technique that reproduces halftones by roughing copper plates. So now, again, you know, as we know with halftone printing, when you print images, this is a dot pattern. So this is actually something that's been around for a long time, but again, manually had to be done uh, with um, a copper plate and a metal tool called a rocker, and they would use all these tiny little pits in the uh, metal to uh, make the image. 1690, near Philadelphia, um, the um, William Rittenhouse he found the first paper mill in the United States. So paper has finally made its, well, um, paper making's been here, but it's been, um, now it's on a much larger scale. It's the first paper mill. 18th century, uh, Jacob Christus Leblanc produces the first engraving uh, in several several colors. Okay, and this is 1710. Okay, he uses the mezzotint method, but now instead he's using uh, red, yellow, and blue. 
later he adds fourth plate bearing black lines. And again, this is basically the foundation of how we print today. So we have the uh, red, yellow, blue, and black. Uh, red is now magenta and uh, blue is cyan, neutral colors to make up all the colors of the world. When you stop and think about that, that, that's what almost, it's 300 plus years ago that uh, this was invented and they were doing it all by hand. William Carlson, an English typographer whose foundry operates in London um, <clears throat> for about 200 years. His Carlson Roman old face cut between, he develops this and runs this uh, typeface uh, for about 12 years. Uh, and ironically, that typeface is still around today. That's what it looks like. See, I told you you'd see that, that type again. Quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. So you get upper and lower cases there. Uh, Gentleman's Magazine is published for the first time in 1731, and it runs un uninterrupted for, until 1922, almost 200 years. Pretty amazing feat. 1732, Benjamin Franklin establishes his own printing office and becomes the first publisher of the Pennsylvania Gazette among his publications as Poor Richard's Almanac becomes very famous. Um, uh, uh, Sen Senefelder invents lithography in 1776, which is a modern, low-cost um, uh, way to print, and it's used for theater. <clears throat> I believe I have a sample of that coming up. And then Bedoni uh, creates a, a typeface, again, all in 1732, uh, and again, it's still used today. So there's the Bedoni uh, sample. Um, 18th, uh, 19th century now, so 1800, Charles Stanhope um, and the, the third Earl Stanhope uh, builds the first printing press. It's the Stanhope press is faster, more durable, and can print larger sheets. Uh, a few years later, uh, another performance improvement is achieved by Frederick uh, uh, Gottlob Koning and Andrew Frederick Bauer who build their first cylinder presses. And <clears throat> their company is still in existence today and is called KBA. That's the name of the business that is still around. 1837, Engelman is awarded a patent for chromolithography. If I'm not mistaken, the um, printing museum in Haverhill uh, just did or is doing a, um, a show on chromolithography. So that's a sample. In fact, I know they are. In fact, I'm not mistaken, it's this weekend, which should be when I'm recording this. So it's uh, November 21st, 2020, uh, is when this is uh, being done at the uh, Printing Museum. They got a bunch of samples. It's a really cool piece. 1842, uh, basically the greeting card industry starts. Uh, this is a Christmas card, or a thousand of them uh, printed. So what they do is they did a base color first, and then they went through and they hand colored all of them. And uh, according to this, uh, information that I got off uh, the web. Uh, there are about 10 of them still in existence today, which is kind of pretty cool. It's a sample of a rotary press, and when you st stop and think about this, if you know anything about printing, six guys on this printing press, um, you know, and it's printing probably one color at a time. Uh, I don't think OSHA was around at the time because you get some people standing on some platforms and there's no railings, and uh, you get this big cylinder going around and I would say you could probably get caught in this pretty easy. So this is really pre-OSHA. <laughs> Nowadays, the same um, type of printing can be done on demand for the most part. So um, <clears throat> this uh, gentleman, Mr. Click, invents a photogravure in 1878. Uh, and again, reproduces photographs in a continuous tone, which is what we're used to seeing now. Um, in 1886, Otmar Mergenthal, he invents the linotype composing machine, which is huge when it comes to the printing industry because now uh, they use a keyboard to set the lines of type. The lines of type are set in lead, and they can reproduce these things at a much faster pace versus hand setting all the type. And once, the type, once they're done with the uh, use of that slug, uh, if it's not something they need to keep, then they just remelt and it gets reused. So it's a modern-day version of some sort of recycling. Uh, here's an um, example of a um, pop-up book. Again, uh, it's, this is um, pretty old. It's called the International Circus. It's well known, uh, and it's a, just a really neat, neat piece when you stop and think about what they were able to achieve when this thing was printed 
you know, a couple hundred years ago. 1890, Bibby Barron and Sons built the first flexo press, a flexography press. And this is, um, you know, we use flexography for a lot of different things, -ish, you know, uh, printing in plastics and stuff like that now. And again, in uh, cardboard industry or the carton industry uses flexo type plates. <clears throat> uh, the downfall is that the uh, ink that they used uh, smears easily and the device becomes known as the Bibby's Folly. Uh, eventually, that gets figured out and ink has changed and uh, for the substrates it, and it becomes, it's one of the primary um, ways we print today. 20th century, 1903, American printer Ira Washington Rubel is instrumental in producing the first lithograph lithographic offset press for paper. Offset presses, you know, and basically you have a plate which is flat and the image on the plate goes to a rubber blanket and then the rubber blanket goes to the substrate, and in this case, it's probably paper. So <clears throat> that is why they call it offset printing, because the image starts, it starts as a wrong, when you get the plate, you ink it, it's right reading, it transfers to the blanket, it's now wrong reading, and when it transfers from the blanket to the paper, it's now back to right reading. So it's what they call offset press. Uh, letter press printing, which was all backwards, that was a direct image to the paper, so it was always backwards. So when it hit the paper, and you'll see an image of this in a minute, uh, when it hits the paper, um, you'll have the image uh, responding on the paper as right reading. 1907, uh, Englishman Samuel Simon is awarded a patent uh, <clears throat> for the process of using silk fabric as a printing screen. So basically, he invents silk screen printing. You know, they use it originally to do wallpaper and printing on fabrics such as linens and silks. And now today, if you look at pretty much anything you're wearing nowadays, uh, it's silkscreen is on T-shirts and a whole list of other things and uh, in that industry. So, again, 1907, silkscreen is invented. Uh, a, few uh, a few new presses manufacturers. Uh, Roland, and now it's known as Man Roland, is established in 1911. 1923, Kimori uh, Machine Works is uh, founded. 1915, Hallmark, uh, founded in 1910, creates an, uh, the first Christmas card. Uh, and just some National Geographics is 1888, Life Magazine, 1883, uh, Time Magazine, 1923, Vogue, 1892, and Reader's Digest in 1920. Some of these magazines are still around, and some are just strictly uh, digital now, online. But Hallmark, for the most part, I mean, as you all know, if you go to CVS or any store, they're probably still the dominant uh, people that make cards. Here's some examples of some stuff, Reader's Digest in the magazines. Uh, in uh, 1923, um, Koenig and Bauer launch a four-color Irish printing press. Uh, it can be used uh, for bank, they use it for banknotes. So banknotes, obviously security reasons, um, and that becomes their main focus. They, they start printing banknotes. <clears throat> uh, and then also in 1923, the first commercially successful series of paperback books is published by Penguin Books in the UK in 1935. In uh, 1931, um, Albatross Books uh, had tried to make a series, but it just didn't really work out well. Uh, and here's Penguin. And um, 1938, uh, zero, zero graphic key, or zero, zerography, sorry. The zerography, a dry photocopying technique, is invented by Chester Carlson. Again, 1938. But the first commercial machine doesn't hit the market until 1949. Uh, and when it does, uh, in 1959, Xerox 914 plain paper copier is a breakthrough. And uh, in the late 50s, uh, it's now where you can actually copy something, uh, you know, uh, from an original. So changes the way we do printing. Uh, <clears throat> 1948, so uh, 1948, uh, is some flatbed printing presses that are being uh, introduced, and 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 then really what changes the game for the printing industry is this, uh, this Heidelberg Teagle press, which is uh, the picture off here to the right-hand side. And when I went to Greater Lowell Tech in 1980 to 84, we actually had one of these presses in the, sh in the shop. So this is done uh, and launched in 1951 at the first Drooper Show. Uh, I don't know what that was, um, but 
um, probably in Germany, if I had to guess. <clears throat> and this revolutionized the way printing uh, was done because it was a very fast process. Uh, this is a video. I'm not going to play it. You can catch this on the uh, online thing. Um, in 1967, the ISBN number or international standard book number is started. Okay, so this gives every basic book a identification. And then uh, there's some new silicone, uh, some new materials like silicone that make it possible for manufacturers uh, to uh, establish tampo print, uh, build more efficient presses, curve for curved surfaces. So if you had like a coffee mug that had an image on it, because the, the, the area is rounded, you would use these types of printing presses to <clears throat> um, uh, do the image or the type on the coffee mugs. So that's an um, example of it. It's a video. I'm not going to play it right now. Um, new, uh, and again, uh, in 1973, uh, newspaper circulation hits the peak. Uh, and it goes up, 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 and then uh, it starts to just decline uh, in the mid-'80s. It starts, the newspaper industry starts to take a hit. Uh, and then, of course, by the 90s, when the Internet starts to come along, then a lot of newspapers start to um, fold up or emerge and stuff like that. It's only a handful of in each town, and a lot of times, each a lot of small towns uh, had their own newspapers, and those are all gone by the wayside for the most part now. Kind of unfortunate. Uh, <clears throat> first laser printers, um, IBM and Xerox, uh, 1975. Again, big beasts of machines. You know, these same pieces of equipment now uh, are uh, take up half half or quarter of the floor space they used to take up. Uh, 1985, desktop publishing starts. You know, it looks familiar. It's Apple. Apple kind of hits the road running, uh, ground running, I should say. And the ironic thing is, I kind of I remember when this kind of all started taking place, and um, you know, you companies like Copygraphic and stuff that were big time in printing companies. Uh, and when Apple kind of came up with this, it was new. It was different. Uh, people like, ah, oh, this is never going to last. Well, what they did was Apple, this is a genius move on Apple's part. They went after the ad, um, ad agencies and the design houses uh, and, and gave, they, they didn't give them the equipment, but they sold it to them for, you know, relatively short money, we'll call it. And as they started using it, what happened is that they would go to the printing companies and the printing companies were kind of forced to kind of jump on board. And then hence the Apple Macintosh computers were born and revolutionized the way we did printing. 86, um, Man Roland uh, introduced the Lithoman commercial web offset presses. You know, um, Polar goes and shows a, a new cutter system, which is now owned by Heidelberg. Uh, just a lot of different things start to really change in the 80s and 90s, and we see a boom in all kinds of things. Xerox, uh, DocuTech launched in 1990. They combine, uh, they can do 135 page uh, per minute black and white device. Uh, which is market breaking at the time. 1992, Australia is the first country to use polymer banknotes, and basically, polymer is plastic uh, for general circu circulation. So they leave paper and go to plastic. Um, other countries followed suit, but the US still uses paper. But ironically, what most people don't know is um, our currency is actually made out of cotton. Uh, digital printing takes off in 93. I remember when the Indigos first came out. It's a print 100 uh, shown below. Uh, it, it just it kind of revolutionized the way we looked at digital printing. This is a liquid toner type machine. Still around, a lot different now. Uh, Indigo eventually ended up selling to HP. Uh, and uh, now it's the HP Indigo. And uh, they this first machine was, I believe, a 1218. And now they go up to a half size 2329, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so here's a HP Indigo press. This picture's from two years ago. Uh, so, yeah, kind of crazy when you stop and think about uh, where digital technology has gone. 21st century, this is a sample of a Goss Sunday newspaper. It's, the, it's a 96-page um, web press, so it prints 96 pages at a time. It's waterless, which is kind of crazy. Uh, and KBA was pretty much known for uh, a lot of their, even offset presses, were known to be waterless. Now, it's not that the, they don't, what happens is the plate cylinders are refrigerated, so they still carry water, but not in the sense that we used to do it uh, <clears throat> on the offset presses. That's how they uh, keep the plates clean. Uh, this is an X press. 
Um, I don't remember what year this came out, but uh, it was a joint effort between Heidelberg and Kodak, and then eventually Kodak ends up taking it over. Uh, <clears throat> it was pretty cool. Um, it's kind of a game changer. Um, they don't have as much, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They don't have much of a stakehold in the industry right now. In fact, I think they pretty much fall by the wayside. But it was a pretty revolutionary the way that they uh, were doing because they were printing four colors like an offset press, four separate cylinders too. So HP, again, they continue to make acquisitions. And in 2001, like I mentioned, they did buy Indigo, uh, Conic and Minolta, uh, the BizHub, Canon uh, with the Image Press range, uh, Potts Canon, you know, they bought out Ose in 2009. Again, it's just a bunch of things that happened and changed. Um, and inkjet presses are now the, the newest and latest technology that's starting to come out. And in 2016, uh, EFI <coughs> um, came out with the uh, C18000. HP had the page wide C500. And then there's a bunch now more, like Konica has one out now. I think it's the 8000. And I know Canon has one. And, uh, and this is all making ways into the core corrugated and packaging industry as well. So our industry continues to change. We have some, another image of a new digital type press. This image is from last year. And that's it, folks. So that's the end of section two. Uh, again, a little bit longer, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, like I mentioned before, feel free to um, email me at rdion at gltech.org. Thanks.